okay, tonight is the uh, 29th of July, yeah? and uh, we come to Majjhima Nikaya Sutta 26, Arya Pariyasana Sutta. Is it loud enough? Is it loud enough? That's what I heard. This Arya Pariyasana, the translation is the noble search. Yeah? Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Bindika Spa. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Savati for arms. Then a number of monks went to the Venerable Ananda and said to him, Friend Ananda, it is long since we had a talk on the Dhamma from the Blessed One's own lips. It would be good if we could get to hear such a talk, friend Ananda. Then let the Venerable Ones go to the Brahmin Ramakas Hermitage. Perhaps you will get to hear a talk on the Dhamma from the Blessed One's own lips. Yes, friend, they replied. We'll stop here for a moment. So this part now it shows that the Buddha did not speak Dhamma very often. Maybe in the uh, early years of his ministry, uh, he spoke more Dhamma. Maybe it was the later years uh, he spoke less Dhamma because a lot of the Dhamma had already been been uh, uh, spoken or uh, taught by the Buddha. So actually, we are very lucky because uh, we can get to uh, know more suttas from the books uh, available now than many monks during the Buddha's time. Many monks during the Buddha's time, sometimes they only get to hear the sutta when they meet the Buddha or, or, or meet a monk who is uh, willing to teach. La. But here we have all uh, about 5,000 suttas in the books, uh, all available to us. Uh. So uh, a Buddhist uh, would be very silly uh, if you did not get the, the Nikaya books uh, to, to investigate. Then when the Blessed One had wandered for arms in Savati and had returned from his arms round, after his meal he addressed the Venerable Ananda. Ananda, let us go to the eastern park, to the palace of Nigara's mother, for the day's abiding. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda replied. Then the Blessed One went with the Venerable Ananda to the eastern park, the palace of Nigara's mother, for the day's abiding. Then when it was evening, the Blessed One rose from meditation and addressed the Venerable Ananda. Amanda, let us go to the eastern bathing place to bathe. Yes, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Ananda replied. Then the Blessed One went with the Venerable Ananda to the eastern bathing place to bathe. When he, had, when he was finished, he came up out of the water and stood in one robe, drying his lips. Then the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, the Brahmin Ramaka's hermitage is nearby. That hermitage is agreeable and delightful. Venerable Sir, it would be good if the Blessed One went there out of compassion. The Blessed One consented in silence. And stop here for a moment. Now. Here you see yeah, that the, the Venerable Ananda, he knows probably yeah, that the Buddha was going to bathe in the eastern bathing place. Lah. That's why, uh, and, and the eastern bathing place uh, is not far from the Ramaka's hermitage. Lah. Probably that was why uh, he asked the monks to wait there. Uh, the Buddha will probably go there at night. Uh. Also, you see this uh, Migara's mother is the name for Visaka, uh, the lady supporter of the Buddha. She is called Migara's mother because the father-in-law's name is Migara. And because uh, this Visaka, she uh, brought the father-in-law into Buddhism and the father was father-in-law is extremely grateful to her, so the father-in-law used to call her mother. Uh, so that's why uh, she is known as, Isaka is known as Migara's mother. Uh, so this palace of Migara's uh, mother, or the eastern park, uh, is a monastery uh, probably that uh, Avisaka uh, uh, donated to the Buddha. Then, uh, you see, the, in the Vinaya books, uh, we find that when the monks, uh, during the Buddha's time, when they uh, took a bath in the uh, river, they would, uh, uh, they would wear only the under robe, uh, what we call the sarong. Uh, 
and then uh, they go into the river as the wa water went higher. Then they take off their the, the sarong uh, and throw it on the shawl or throw it on the bush. Uh, and then uh, they would bathe. Uh, and when after bathing, uh, they come out naked. And then they go and retrieve their, their, their rope and put it on. So the Buddha had come out of the water and he was drying his limbs. Uh, so the Buddha, so the remember Ananda asked the Buddha to go to Ramaka's hermitage and the Buddha agreed. Uh, then the Blessed One went to the Brahmin Ramaka's hermitage. Now on that occasion, a number of monks were sitting together in the hermitage discussing the Dhamma. The Blessed One stood outside the door waiting for their discussion to end. When he knew that it was over, he coughed and knocked, and the monks opened the door for him. The Blessed One entered, sat down on a seat made ready, and addressed the monks thus, Monks, for what discussion are you sitting together here now? And what was your discussion that was interrupted? Venerable Sir, our discussion on the Dhamma that was interrupted was about the Blessed One Himself. Then the Blessed One arrived. Good monks, it is fitting for you clansmen who have gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness to sit together to discuss the Dhamma. When you gather together, monks, you should do either one of two things. Hold discussion, or oh, sorry, you should do either of two things. Hold discussion on the Dhamma or maintain noble silence. Let's stop here for a moment, man. So you see, the Buddha was very courteous. He knew that the monks were discussing Dhamma, and then he, instead of knocking on the door, he just waited, waited for the talk to end. Then, when he knew that they had finished discussion, he coughed and knocked the door, and they opened the door for him. So the Buddha said, when monks come together, they should either keep noble silence, not talk, or if they do talk, then to discuss the Dhamma. So you all, uh, now you all training, uh, so you all uh, don't talk too much and don't talk too loud. Monks, there are these two kinds of search, the noble search and the ignoble search. And what is the ignoble search? Here someone being himself subject to birth, seeks, all, seeks what is also subject to birth. Being himself subject to aging, he seeks, he seeks what is also subject to aging. Being himself subject to sickness, he seeks what is also subject to sickness. Being himself subject to death, he seeks what is also subject to death. Being himself subject to sorrow, he seeks what is also subject to sorrow. Being himself subject to defilement, he seeks, he seeks what is also subject to defilement. And what may be said to be subject to birth? Wife and children are subject to birth. Men and women slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses and mares, gold and silver, silver are subject to birth. Gold and silver means money are subject to birth. These objects of attachment are subject to birth. And one who is tied to these things, infatuated with them and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to birth, seeks what is also subject to birth. And what may be said to be subject to aging. Wife and children are subject to aging. Men and women slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses and mares, gold and silver are subject to aging. These objects of attachment are subject to aging. And one who is tied to these things, infatuated with them, and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to aging, seeks what is also subject to aging. And what may be said to be subject to sickness? Wife and children are subject to sickness. Men and women slaves. Goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses and mares are subject to sickness. These objects of attachment are subject to sickness. And one who is tied to these things, infatuated with them and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to sickness, seeks what is also subject to sickness. And what may be said to be subject to death? Wife and children are subject to death. Men and women slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, cat elephants, cattle, horses and mares are subject to death. These objects of attachment are subject to death. And one who is tied to these things, infatuated with them and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to death, 
seeks what is also subject to death and what may be said to be subject to sorrow. Wife and children are subject to sorrow, men and women slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses and mares are subject to sorrow. These objects of attachment are subject to sorrow, and one who is tied to these things, infatuated with them and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to sorrow, seeks what is also subject to sorrow, and what may be said to be subject to defilement. Wife and children are subject to defilement, men and women slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and pigs, elephants, cattle, horses and mares, gold and silver are subject to defilement. These objects of attachment are subject to defilement, and one who is tied to these things, infatuated with them and utterly committed to them, being himself subject to defilement, seeks what is also subject to this to defilement. This is the ignoble search. I'll stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is saying that a person who seeks after worldly things, the normal things that a lay person looks for, uh, wife and children, property, money, and all this, uh, are all subject to birth, aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement. And what is a noble search? Here someone, being himself subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, seeks the unborn supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Being himself subject to aging, having understood the danger in what is subject to aging, he seeks the unaging supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Being himself subject to sickness, having understood the danger in what is subject to sickness, he seeks the unailing supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Being himself subject to death, having understood the danger in what is subject to death, he seeks the deathless supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Being himself subject to sorrow, having understood the danger in what is subject to sorrow, he seeks the sorrowless supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Being himself subject to defilement, having understood the danger in what is subject to defilement, he seeks the undefiled supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. This is the noble search. So here the Buddha says, the noble or Aryan search, is uh, the search for Nibbana. Uh, if a person understands the Dhamma, that all worldly things uh, are subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, defilement, uh, and then uh, he will let go of these things uh, and look for a way out of all these uh, worldly things uh, and look for the supreme security from bondage, uh, which is Nibbana. Monks, before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I too, being subject to birth, sought what was also subject to birth. Being myself subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow and defilement, I sought what was also subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow and defilement. Then I considered thus, why, being myself subject to birth, do I seek what is also subject to birth? Why? Being myself subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement, do I seek what is also subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement? Suppose that being myself subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, I seek the unborn supreme security from bondage, Nibbana. Suppose that being myself subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement, Having understood the danger in what is subject to aging, sickness, death, sorrow, and defilement, I seek the unaging, unailing, deathless, sorrowless, and undefiled supreme security from bondage. Later, while still young, a black-haired young man, endowed with the blessing of youth, in the prime of life, though my mother and father wished otherwise, and wept with tearful faces, I shaved off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and went forth from the home life into homelessness. Stop here for a moment. So here you see, uh, in the suttas, uh, the Buddha's, in the sutta here, uh, the Buddha says uh, very clearly, uh, in front of his parents, uh, even though his parents were weeping uh, and trying to restrain him from going forth, uh, in front of them uh, he shaved off his hair and beard and put on the yellow robe uh, and left the home. Uh, 
uh, later uh, later books uh, they try to put it in, uh, in a more romantic sort of way like I said that the Buddha in the middle of the night took a last look at his son and the wife and went off on his horse uh, <laughs> but he didn't go up on his horse like he walked away <laughs> Having gone forth monks in search of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I went to Alara Kalama and said to him, Friend Kalama, I want to lead the holy life in this Dhamma Vinaya. Dhamma Vinaya is the teaching. Huh? Alara Kalama replied, The Venerable One may stay here. This Dhamma is such that a wise man can soon enter upon and abide in it realizing for himself through direct knowledge his own teacher's doctrine. I soon quickly learned that Dhamma. As far as mere lip reciting and rehearsal of his teaching went, I could speak with knowledge and assurance, and I claim, I know and see, and there were others who did likewise. I considered, it is not through mere faith alone that Alara Kalama declares, by realizing for myself with direct knowledge, I enter upon and abide in this Dhamma. Certainly, Alara Kalama abides knowing and seeing this Dhamma. Then I went to Alara Kalama and asked him, Friend Kalama, in what way do you declare that by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge, you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma? In reply, he declared the base of nothingness. Let's stop here for a moment. So here, soon after the Buddha went forth, he went to look for meditation teachers. So this first meditation teacher, he looked for was Alara Kalama. And this Alara Kalama is a person who had attained the Arupa Jhana, the base of nothingness, which is actually a very high state of meditation. I consider not only Alara Kalama has faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom, I too have faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. Suppose I endeavor to realize the Dhamma that Alara Kalama declares he enters upon and abides in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. I soon quickly entered upon and abided in that Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. Then I went to Alara Kalama and asked him, Friend Kalama, is it in this way that you declare that you enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge? That is the way, friend. It is in this way, friend, that I also enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. And Alara said, It is a gain for us, friend. It is a great gain for us that we have such a venerable one for our companion in the holy life. So the Dhamma that I declare I enter upon and abide in by realizing for myself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge. And the Dhamma that you enter upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that I declare I enter upon and abide in by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. So you know the Dhamma that I know, and I know the Dhamma that you know. As I am, so are you. As you are, so am I. Come, friend, let us lead this community together. Thus, Alara Kalama, my teacher, praised me, his pupil, on an equal footing with himself and awarded me the highest honor. But it occurred to me, this Dhamma does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana, but only to reappearance in the base of nothingness. Not being satisfied with that Dhamma, I left it and went away. Stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha, he, had, he, he managed to attain uh, this high meditation state uh, which his teacher had achieved, uh, this base of nothingness, uh, Rupa Jhana. But because the teacher was not enlightened, uh, the teacher did not have the Buddha Dhamma, did not have the Dhamma that was uh, um, necessary uh, to attain liberation. Uh, so he, he only had this uh, meditative uh, st- uh, experience on it. So he, the Buddha, re- the, the Bodhisattva, he realized that uh, he was not going to get enlightened uh, with, under this teacher. So he left the teacher. Uh. Still in search, monks, of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I went to Udaka Ramaputta and said to him, Friend, 
I want to lead the holy life in this Dhamma Vinaya. Udaka Ramaputta replied, The Venerable One may stay here. This Dhamma is such that a wise man can soon enter upon and abide in it, himself realizing through direct knowledge his teachers, his own teacher's doctrine. I soon quickly learned that Dhamma. As far as mere lip reciting and rehearsal of his teaching went, I could speak with knowledge and assurance, and I claimed I know and see. But there were others who did likewise. I considered it is not through mere faith alone that, Ram, that Rama declared, by realizing for myself with direct knowledge, I enter and abide, and abide in this Dhamma. Certainly Rama abided knowing and seeing this Dhamma. Then I went to Udaka Ramaputta and asked him, Friend, in what way did Rama declare that by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, he entered upon and abided in this Dhamma? In reply, Udaka Ramaputta declared the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Stop here for a moment. So this second meditation teacher he went to uh, was also a very a good meditator uh, who could attain the base of neither perception nor non-perception, which is the highest arupa jhana, uh, very near to the state of cessation of perception and feeling already. Uh, uh. So uh, this was the second teacher. Uh. I considered not only Rama had faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. I too have faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Suppose I endeavor to realize that Dhamma, that Rama declared he entered upon and abided in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. Let's stop here for a moment. Uh. These five things uh, are called the five faculties. Uh, faith, energy, mindfulness, and concentration. Concentration and wisdom. Uh. Uh. I soon quickly entered upon and abided in that Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. Then I went to Udaka Ramaputta and asked him, Friend, was it in this way that Rama declared that he entered upon and abided in this Dhamma by realizing for himself with direct knowledge? That is the way, friend. It is in this way, friend, that I also enter upon and abide in this Dhamma by realizing for myself with direct knowledge. And Rama said, It is a gain for us, friend. It is a great gain for us that we have such a venerable one for our companion in the holy life. So the Dhamma that Rama declared he entered upon and abided in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that you entered upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge. And the Dhamma that you entered upon and abide in by realizing for yourself with direct knowledge is the Dhamma that Rama declared he entered upon and abided in by realizing for himself with direct knowledge. So you know the Dhamma that Rama knew, and Rama knew the Dhamma that you know. As Rama was, so are you. As you are, so was Rama. Come, friend, let now, now lead this community. Thus Udaka Ramaputta, my companion in the holy life, placed me in the position of a teacher and accorded me the highest honor. But it occurred to me, this Dhamma does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana, but only to reappearance in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Not being satisfied with that Dhamma, I left it and went away. I'll stop here for a moment. So in the same way, uh, the Buddha left this uh, uh, Rama, uh, Udaka Ramaputta, because uh, his teaching uh, did not uh, lead to liberation or enlightenment. Uh, still in search, monks, of what is wholesome, seeking the supreme state of sublime peace, I wandered by stages through the Magadan country until eventually I arrived at Sinani Gama near Uruvela. There I saw an agreeable piece of ground, a delightful grove with a clear flowing river with pleasant smooth banks and nearby a village for arms resort. I considered this is an agreeable piece of ground. This is a delightful grove with a clear flowing river with pleasant smooth banks and nearby a village for arms resort. This will serve for the striving of a clansman intent on striving. And I sat down there thinking this will serve for striving. I stop here for a moment. So here, actually, the Buddha is talking about the last part of his struggle. Eh? After six years, eh? uh, after he left the two meditation teachers, eh? he practiced various types of unbeneficial ascetic practices, eh? for which he suffered a lot. Uh, eating particular types of food, going naked, 
uh, fasting, uh, eating less and less, uh, uh, go to, going to all kinds of extremes. Uh, all these uh, are mentioned, I think, in the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 12. Uh, so it was after six years, uh, finally, he came to this place uh, uh, near Uruvela. Uh, then monks, being myself subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, seeking the supreme secure, su, su, seeking the unborn supreme security from bondage nibbana, I attain the unborn supreme security from bondage nibbana. Being myself subject to aging, having understood the danger in what is subject to aging, seeking the unaging supreme security from bondage nibbana. I attain the unaging supreme security from bondage nibbana. Being myself subject to sickness, having understood the danger in what is subject to sickness, seeking the unailing supreme security from bondage nibbana. I attain the unailing supreme security from bondage nibbana. Being myself subject to death, having understood the danger in what is subject to death, seeking the deathless supreme security from bondage nibbana. I attain the deathless supreme security from bondage nibbana. Being myself subject to sorrow, having understood the danger in what is subject to sorrow, seeking the sorrowless supreme security from bondage nibbana. I attain the sorrowless supreme security from bondage nibbana. Being myself subject to defilement, having understood the danger in what is subject to defilement, seeking the undefiled supreme security from bondage nibbana. I attain the undefiled supreme security from bondage nibbana. The knowledge and vision arose in me. My deliverance is unshakable. This is my last birth. Now there is no renewal of being. So here the Buddha uh, says uh, he became enlightened in this place. I consider this Dhamma that I have attained is profound, hard to see and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle to be experienced by the wise. But this generation delights in worldliness, takes delight in worldliness, rejoices in worldliness. It is hard for such a generation to see this truth, namely specific conditionality, dependent origination. And it is, and it is hard to see this truth, namely the stilling of all volitions, the relinquishing of all attachments, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. If I were to teach the Dhamma, others would not understand me, and that would be wearying and troublesome for me. Thereupon there came to me spontaneously these stanzas never heard before, enough with teaching the Dhamma that even I found hard to reach, for it will never be perceived by those who live in lust and hate. Those died in lust, wrapped in darkness, will never discern this abstruse Dhamma, which goes against the worldly stream, subtle, deep, and difficult to see. Considering thus, my mind inclined to inaction rather than to teaching the Dhamma. Let's stop here for a moment. So our Buddha, after he became enlightened, then he considered and he realized that most living beings, most humans, will not want to learn the Dhamma or practice the Dhamma. That's why actually most Buddhas are Pacheka Buddhas. You can see 99.99% of Buddhas are Pacheka Buddhas because uh, we find uh, uh, the Buddha said uh, that after he became enlightened, uh, he looked into the past uh, and he probably stayed awake the whole night uh, and he looked through the past 91 world cycles uh, and he saw only six Samasambuddhas uh, willing to teach the Dhamma to the world. Uh, whereas in the Isigili Sutta, the Buddha says at one time there was this Isigili hill uh, outside Rajagaha. At one time there were 500 Pachika Buddhas staying on that hill. Uh, so you see, Pachika Buddhas you can find a lot, but some are some Buddhas are uh, very, very few. Uh, so, so much for the Mahayana vow to become a, a, a Buddha. After they become a Buddha, they will not want to teach. Uh. <laughs> Then monks, the Brahma Sahampati knew with his mind, the thought in my mind, and he considered, the world will be lost, the world will perish, since the mind of the Tathagata, Arahan, Samasambuddha, inclines to inaction rather than to teaching the Dhamma. 
Then just as quickly as a strong man might extend his flex arm or flex his extended arm, the Brahma Sahampati vanished in the Brahma world and reappeared before me. He arranged his upper robe on one shoulder and extending his hands in reverential salutation towards me said, Rebel Sir, let the Blessed One teach the Dhamma. Let the Sublime One teach the Dhamma. There are beings with little dust in their eyes who are wasting through not hearing the Dhamma. There will be those who will understand the Dhamma. The Brahma Sahampati spoke thus, and then he said further, In Magadha there have appeared till now impure teachings devised by those still stained. Open the doors to the deathless. Let them hear the Dhamma that the stainless one has found. Just as one who stands on a mountain peak can see below the people all around, so wise one, all seeing sage, ascend the palace of the Dhamma, that the sorrowless one survey this human breed, engulfed in sorrow, overcome by birth and old age. Arise, victorious hero, caravan leader, deathless one, and wander in the world. Let the Blessed One teach the Dhamma. There will be those who will understand. Then I, lis then I listened to the Brahma's pleading, and out of compassion for beings, I surveyed the world with the eye of a Buddha. Surveying the world with the eye of a Buddha, I saw beings with little dust in their eyes, and, which, and with much dust in their eyes, with keen faculties and with dull faculties, with good qualities and with bad qualities, easy to teach and hard to teach, and some who dwelt seeing fear in blame and in the world. Just as in a pond of blue or red or white lotuses, some lotuses that are born and grow in the water thrive immersed in the water without rising out of it. And some other lotuses that are born and grow in the water rest on the water's surface. And some other lotuses that are born and grow in the water rise out of the water and stand clear, unwetted by it. So too, surveying the world with the eye of a Buddha, I saw beings with little dust in their eyes and with much dust in their eyes, with keen faculties and with dull faculties, with good qualities and with bad qualities, easy to teach and hard to teach, and some who dwelt seeing fear in blame and in the world. Then I replied to the Brahma Sahampati in stanzas, Open for them are the doors to the deathless. Let those with ears now show their faith. Thinking it would be troublesome, O Brahma, I did not speak the Dhamma, subtle and sublime. Then Brahma Sahampati thought, I have created the opportunity for the Blessed One to teach the Dhamma. And after paying homage to me, keeping me on the right, he thereupon departed at once. I'll stop here for a moment. This is Brahma Sahampati in some other sutta. I think the Sanyutta Nikaya, it is stated that he was a monk in the previous life. Uh, he was a monk in the previous life. So, uh, after becoming a Brahma, so whenever somebody becomes enlightened, uh, he knows uh, he knows that, that uh, he should uh, ask uh, the enlightened one to teach the Dhamma. Uh. Also, the other thing you can uh, infer uh, from these uh, few passages uh, is that uh, the difference between a Pacheka Buddha and a Samasam Buddha is only that one wants to teach uh, and the other one does not want to teach. Uh. It's not like some other later books say, yeah? some other later books say that the Pachika Buddha doesn't know how to teach, yeah? cannot teach. Yeah? That's not true. You see, our Buddha would have become a Pachika Buddha, right? It's only because of Brahma Sahampati yeah? appealing to him yeah? that he decided to teach. Yeah? So all Buddhas, because they have enlightened, yeah? they know the path so well, how can they not uh, How can they not know how to teach? They all know how to teach, only it's whether they want or not. Yeah? I considered thus, to whom should I first teach the Dhamma? Who will understand this Dhamma quickly? It then occurred to me, Alara Kalama is wise, intelligent and discerning. He has long had little dust in his eyes. Suppose I taught the Dhamma first to Alara Kalama. He will understand it quickly. Then deities approached me and said, Remember, sir, Alara Kalama died seven days ago. And the knowledge and vision arose in me. Alara Kalama died seven days ago. I thought, Alara Kalama's loss is a great one. If he had heard this Dhamma, he would have understood it quickly. I considered thus, to whom should I first teach the Dhamma? Who will understand this Dhamma quickly? 
It then occurred to me, Udaka Ramaputta is wise, intelligent and discerning. He has long had little dust in his eyes. Suppose I taught the Dhamma first to Udaka Ramaputta. He will understand it quickly. Then deities approached me and said, Venerable Sir, Udaka Ramaputta died last night. And the knowledge and vision arose in me. Udaka Ramaputta died last night. I thought, Udaka Ramaputta's loss is a great one. If he had heard this Dhamma, he would have understood it quickly. I'll stop here for a moment now. So here you see, eh, after the Buddha was enlightened, eh, he was looking for the most, um, what do you say, the most uh, suitable person eh, to teach. Eh, and he decided on his two meditation teachers. Why? Because here, as the Buddha says, eh, they have little dust in their eyes. Uh, how come they have little dust in their eyes? Because they have attained jhana. And because they have attained jhana, they have got rid of the five hindrances uh, that obstruct wisdom. Uh, so, if you teach uh, somebody uh, who has jhana, uh, who has got rid of the five hindrances, uh, he will understand very quickly. Uh, so, even after these two uh, persons also, uh, the, the, the next few persons that the Buddha uh, taught, uh, uh, they also had attained jhana, either in this lifetime or the previous lifetime. That's why, uh, just upon hearing the Dhamma, many of them uh, became arahants, uh, just by hearing the Dhamma. The other thing I want to say here is, uh, after uh, the, the Buddha knew uh, that Alara Kalama and Udaka Ramaputta had passed away uh, and reborn in heaven, uh, why didn't he go to heaven to teach them? Uh, uh, because it's not possible. Why? Because uh, in some other sutta, the Buddha said uh, that the uh, flesh body uh, can only fly as far as the Brahma world, uh, the first jhana, heaven. Uh, the other heavens are too far away. This flesh body cannot cannot reach. This rocket has, has got a limit. <laughs> Although he, his mind, he may know uh, there are some the other beings there, but he cannot contact them too far away. Mm. So these are the two things. Huh? Remember, huh? the most ideal person huh, to understand the Dhamma is one who has got rid of the five hindrances. Huh? And the minimum huh, you need to get rid of the five hindrances huh, is uh, threshold concentration, very close to the first jhana. It's mentioned in the Viga Nikaya. I considered thus, to whom should I first teach the Dhamma? Who will understand this Dhamma quickly? It then occurred to me, the monks of the group of five who attended upon me while I was engaged in my striving were very helpful. Suppose I taught the Dhamma first to them. Then I thought, where are the monks of the group of five now living? And with the divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw that they were living at Benares in the deer park at Isipatana. Stop here for a moment. So after that the Buddha decided to teach uh, the five monks uh, who were his disciples uh, uh, when he was striving to become enlightened. So since the Buddha had already attained uh, jhanas, uh, I'm sure uh, he would have taught the group of five monks. Uh, that's why he went to teach them, because they, are, they have also got rid of the five hindrances. Uh, 